Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Puppeteers of Color conversation series. I'm David Bizarro. I'm one of the creators of this series. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, if you're watching the recording, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I think this is going to be a really wonderful uh, event. Um, so first off, I wanted to talk about why we started this. Um, you know, not too long ago, I had experienced uh, my own uh, negative situation and I was feeling frustrated and angry and was talking to a lot of my friends in the community. And through us talking, we were sharing stories with one another and talking about how to deal with it and how to uh, move in a po positive direction. And while discussing that with my wife, you know, she had this great idea that, you know, what you were doing with your friends was really healing and you were all learning together and growing together. So what if we took that and created a, a place where we could have discussions with people in our community about uh, their own experiences and what they learned and how they uh, feel that they can grow and also their thoughts on how the community can grow together. And so that's why we created this. And I'm just really, really excited and, and, and happy that everybody's here. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, a moderator panel, but we're also going to have a Q&A. And uh, that Q&A is going to be led by Chris Thomas Hayes. And so I just wanted to bring on Chris to talk about uh, how that's going to go. What's going on, everybody? Hope you guys are doing well out there and staying safe. Um, I'm Chris Hayes. I'm going to be handling the Q&As for this uh, whole panel. Uh, if you are watching the recording, you you really can't submit questions. But if you're here now, you can actually submit questions uh, in your interface and I'll be able to um, view them and try to get them through to the panel um, as best as I can. Um, so a couple of things, uh, just obviously, I don't even have to really say this, but I say it anyway, just remember to uh, remain respectful with your questions. Um, there's an anonymous uh, uh, option. So if you are nervous about how looking stupid or sounding stupid, even though you probably won't, um, uh, you can put that on there too. Uh, secondly, just like really think about your questions. If it's something that you can probably figure out from Wikipedia, then that may be the best move to make. But I'm sure we're gonna have great questions. I'm super excited. Um, yeah, that's it. Feel great. I'm glad you guys uh, showed up. This is great. Thanks, Dave. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm yeah. I'm so excited to, to hear what everyone uh, is curious about and wants to learn. Um, so. Our moderator is a really amazing human being, one of my friends. Uh, her name is Liz Hara. And if you do not know her, uh, I wanted to just take a moment to talk about her because she's incredible. Uh, Liz Hara is an amazing Los Angeles-based writer, builder, and puppeteer. Uh, she's built puppets and costumes for many, theatrical, uh, <laughs> for many theatrical and film productions, including Avenue Q, Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark, The Lion King, uh, in 2015, she, she and her team won an Emmy Award for Best Costume Design for their work on Sesame Street. And I'm just getting started. Liz also writes and puppet wrangles for Sesame Street. Uh, and she also won an Emmy for Outstanding Writing in 2018. It's incredible. She's, oh my gosh, I love her so much. Uh, she has also written for CBS's Life in Pieces, Apple Plus's Helpsters, which is just a amazing show, uh, HBO's uh, Esme and Roy, and Nature Cat and Odd Squad for PBS. It's just incredible. Uh, her newest gig, which I'm so excited about, uh, is writing for Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, the newest Marvel superhero cartoon for Disney. That's just incredible. Um, and also, outside of her professional accolades, she's also an incredible dancer. She's probably the most fun person you'll see at a wedding. And she has an encyclopedic, like, knowledge of candy. Like, if there's any candy you're curious about, or if you're wondering, is there a candy that kind of is like this, ask Liz. She probably knows exactly what that is. So uh, without <laughs> any more delay, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Hara. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys, uh, in enjoys the event. Thank you so much. Uh, it says the host has, there we go. Hey guys, first of all, probably I could stand to edit down my bio a little bit, but thank you, David, very much for that introduction. 
Uh, and I am thrilled to be bringing on our panelists today. Um, but first, before I get started, I just wanted to say the thing I am most excited about for these conversations. Um, just that I would love for the takeaway for these to not only be the content of the conversations, but also the ability to have these conversations. I think it's so important to practice uh, learning how to be vulnerable in these spaces. And I know that everybody is very worried about any kind of misstep when we get into this type of conversation. Um, and I would just hate for us to not feel comfortable doing the work for fear of making a mistake. So I just really want to thank everybody so much for showing up and being brave and committing to doing the work. Uh, so with that in mind, um, let me bring on our first panelist, Pam Arciero. Pam uh, performs for film, television, and theater. She is a principal puppeteer with Sesame Street, performing Grungetta Grouch. Pam directs for theater, television, and film, and she is the artistic director of the National Puppetry Conference at the O'Neill Theater Center, and they just did a wonderful week of work. Uh, Pam is also the secretary of the board of the Jim Henson Foundation. Welcome, Pam. Hello, I'm so glad to be here, and Liz, I want to thank you and David and Cassie for setting this whole thing up. It was a brilliant idea. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and our next panelist is Noel McNeil. Noel launched his career on Sesame Street, where he honed his craft with puppetry legends Jim Henson and Frank Oz. You may have heard of them. Uh, and went on to perform, write, and even direct such shows as Eureka's Castle and Bear in the Big Blue House. Noel received a daytime Emmy nomination for Outstanding Performer in a Children's Series as Bear, and is resident puppeteer for the Emmy Award-winning HBO series Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Noel can be found on TikTok, Cameo, his podcast Noel's Book Nook on Apple, and is currently developing his original series for autistic and special needs kids, The Show Me Show, which has a channel on YouTube. Welcome, Noel. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having us. And again, I echo what Pam just said. Thank you guys for setting this whole kind of thing up. And I look forward to what we're going to say, as well as like your future guests. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> um, and just to start out with, can you share with everybody what your background is culturally and how you identify? Um, for me, I identify as uh, African American because I was born and raised in uh, Central Harlem in uh, New York City, so I am a native New Yorker. And so I identify as African American, even though I get questioned about whether or not I am African American because I don't look it. So, <laughs> but we'll get into that later. But I basically, I am, <laughs> I am African American. Also found out through the magic of Facebook and Ancestry.com, I am also half Scottish. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very funny. Um, I consider myself multiracial. Um, I am, when I did my ancestry, I was from 13 different areas of the globe. Um, and interestingly enough, what we had been told growing up as what our ethnic background was, was not exactly right. Um, you know, I mean, we, we just know what we're told as children. Um, but essentially, I am 22% Asian, mostly Japanese of so. And so, um, and then there's also, there's so much in there. There's, there's Hawaiian, there's Italian, there's, you know, I'm, we call ourselves poi dogs in Hawaii. I was born and raised in Honolulu. Um, and poi dogs are mutts, you know, we're just the mix of everything. And um, heavily identified with actually Japanese culture and Hawaiian culture. And then of course, uh, American culture that came in from the mainland. That's kind of who we, we're brought up to be, you know, we're Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my first question is, throughout your career, how do you feel your cultural backgrounds have influenced the characters that you play, both in terms of the opportunities you're given and what you bring to the characters? 
Uh, well, for me, I was on this show back in the mid nineties. It was called Puzzle Place. So that's probably the most spot on puppet I've ever done with uh, Leon, who was African American. And each character, uh, the puppeteers had like certain characters that, that uh, represented a certain group. So I was Leon, Carmen Aspar was Kiki, Jim Martin was Ben. And so, and, and um, there were other characters, but mine being African American, he was from New York City. And so it was, it was fun playing that character as well as the fact of bringing my own, I wouldn't say my own culture, but just my own personality. Cause I decided way back in the beginning that this show needs an edge. So my character is going to be the snarky one. <laughs> and so um, I just used that, but we did go into like, um, I believe there was an episode about how um, Leon was sort of dissed and had to kind of explain to everybody that it was because he was black. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it was interesting. Yeah, I think that in some ways, um, the cultural background for me has helped because I, I'm kind of a chameleon. I can be a lot of different ethnic groups because I honestly am a lot of different ethnic groups. Um, and I remember reading a manifesto a long time ago about um, I reserve the right to be any ethnic group that I have, that I've raised with, that's in my blood. I can, I claim them as mine, you know, and I really do. Um, the most obvious was probably there are times when I do Hawaiian characters, um, both on Sesame Street and uh, Between the Lions, I'll pull some Hawaiian cultural things into it. And, um, but the overall thing for me is I think that always comes through as who I am, that every character I do, that piece comes through whatever that, you know, whatever ethnic thing I'm doing, it's, it's still what's coming through for me. And when you're in those situations, do you feel a responsibility? Basically, what is your sense of responsibility in terms of representing your culture when you have those characters? Um, well, being puppets, you want to have fun first. I mean, that's that's the main thing because it's it's a puppet. So, but uh, I remember um, there was like for going back to puzzle, there was one uh, script where my character Leon wasn't at the puzzle place, but he calls in because he's in the school play. And in the script, when they uh, check the, the, the video screen, he's dressed like George Washington because he's gonna be in the school play, he gets to be George Washington. And it said that he would have the full outfit and the powdered wig. Then when we got to that episode uh, and I saw his outfit, it got changed to this like brown colonial outfit. And then in the script, they changed it to Frederick Douglass. So he couldn't be there because in the school play, he was gonna play Frederick Douglass, which at the time I thought, okay, I can understand like you want kids to be aware and exposed to someone like Frederick Douglass and his accomplishments. But part of me was still kind of disappointed <laughs> that this kid, this black kid couldn't pretend to be George Washington. And decades later on Broadway, Chris Jackson, black, bald, <laughs> gets to play George Washington. <laughs> Yeah, um, Noel and I go pretty far back, and I we're the old ones. Let's just get us out of the way, okay? <laughs> we're gonna start this conversation with the old guard, <laughs> and then we'll progressively get there so that you know, in a couple of weeks, Tal Ben will be on here. <laughs> Not I, um, old, accomplished. Yes. Well, okay. Uh, I just remember that Noel actually always did want to be president, didn't you, Noel? That was one of your childhood yes. goals was to yeah. be president. Yeah, I, I was a part of this uh, commercial for uh, the Urban League, and they did this commercial called Give a Damn, and they came to our school and they asked different kids like what they wanted to be when they grow up, and I said the president, and they freeze on my face. The last one I was like, "Can you help kids realize their dream and all that?" And at the time I wanted to be the president because he had that really cool, long, shiny car. <laughs> I had no idea what he did, but he had that really cool, shiny car. I was like, yeah, I want that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You can also be Pope. They have a cool car. Exactly. <laughs> and there's, there's still time for you to be president. Yes, there is. I believe in you. <laughs> um, I... I think that first and foremost, yes, you have to be a good puppeteer. You have to be entertaining. You have to, um, you know, present the material in a way that's appealing. And then I also do want that cultural imperative to come through. I do want you to know that I am there, that, that I am representing something from 
either my past or what the, the script is requiring of me to present for you to understand and hopefully to broaden your respect for what we do, both in terms of being a puppeteer and both in terms of who we are as people, as culturally diverse people. I think that's super important for me. Um, let's see. And growing up, um, do you recall any specific hurdles or disadvantages educationally that affected your career, either positively or negatively? Not, not education wise, because, uh, my, well, my mom wanted me to get the best education. So when it was time for junior high, high school, um, she rolled me downtown at a school called the Road School, and it was a private school. And so she wanted to make sure that I got the best education, because growing back then in Harlem, it was a choice between the school where the kid got stabbed or the kid got shot. So she sent me downtown. And there was great because I actually got to meet other people from other cultures and other backgrounds because it was a very international uh, school which was a really huge advantage and I think that's what's kind of like lacking so many people just don't have the advantage and the opportunity to meet other people they're just in this little bubble there are people when growing up I knew people who never went below 125th street because there was like there was no need for them to do that so all these other things they just, they just missed out on and just the experience of seeing and meeting other people. Because that's the advantage of living in New York, at least, well, in the, in the before, you could run into people <laughs> and see like all walks. Remember that? Uh, yes, remember, yeah. the, remember the before? Yeah. <laughs> you got no. together with people, yeah. <laughs> and you could run into people just on the subway or the bus. And so that was a, a big advantage. But I remember realizing at an early age, one of the reasons puppetry appealed to me was because I realized that uh, uh, not being white, I would be limited in what acting roles I could get. I would either be like, you know, a slave or a drug addict or a gang member. And so yeah. that's when I realized like puppetry opened more doors for me. I can't be Abraham Lincoln, but I could be Abraham Lincoln's hat. No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make a great hat, no. Thank you. Um, remember, remember, remember Lidsville? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, do we have to? Um, <laughs> I grew up sort of in a, um, so my neighborhood was mostly Japanese and uh, very diverse. My next door neighbor was Chinese. Across the street was a co Korean family. There was a Japanese, fa many Japanese families. The, uh, on the corner was a Hawaiian Jewish family. L literally, my friend growing up was Noah Lani Epstein was her name. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, there was a Hawaiian family up the street and a, a mixed, you know, Howley, which is what we call people who are, well, Howley technically means stranger or foreigner, but it has kind of come to mean white people in general um, in Hawaii. Um, but um, because of the way I look, very often I was lumped into the Howley mode, especially if I was in a crowd of all Japanese kids and me, what do I look like? I don't look like another Japanese kid, right? Um, and the other thing is that um, culturally, uh, Asian students are very quiet in class. And um, they don't raise their hand very often. They have to really be encouraged to speak out when I was growing up in particular. Um, and this is sort of an interesting cultural thing I learned from another friend, but um, uh, the lovely Kathy Kim said that in, in Korean culture and Japanese culture, I believe too, you don't wanna be the nail that's sticking up, right? because the hammer is going to come and pound you down. So you definitely want to be the one that's like everybody else. And, and it's, the, it's a security, it's a safety, socially speaking. Of course, I had the mix up of being half Italian and a bunch of other stuff mixed in there. So I was always talking. And so in school, I was always being sent to the principal's office for being too <laughs> loud and noisy. <laughs> but it wasn't really, a, I mean, it was a little weird but but it sort of formed me into this person who was just going to go ahead and speak her mind no matter what right um here you have all these other people around you who are telling you Shh. you know and i was not going to be doing that i was going to figure it out my own way which is sort of how it's always been um and there is something about being a puppeteer you're always an other you know i mean Let's face it, if you want to be in puppetry, you're not exactly the run-of-the-mill person. <laughs> you? 
<laughs> you're not you're not the kid who wants you know people are just going to look at you and say you're going to play with dolls <laughs> you know it's it's a hard thing so we're kind of always out there um, but educationally, I don't really see a real hurdle. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I went through my school systems just fine. I went to all public schools my whole life and public universities. And there wasn't really any stumbling blocks for me more. I mean, being a woman is a harder stumbling block, actually, than than for my uh, multicultural background. So Yeah. Um, but actually, kind of going back to that idea, how has being a minority both led you to puppetry and also what are the particular challenges that mm. it has presented? Well, again, being other, I don't know. Puppetry is one of those things when it kind of finds you and then when you find it and you, you the light goes off and you just go, okay, so this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Who knew? Mm -hmm. And then you go and find out everything you can. And once that spark is lit, it's very hard to put out that fire and that desire to, desire to be a puppeteer. So even if there are hurdles thrown in front of you, if you can't deal with them, be them ethnic in orientation or you know, gender in orientation, if you can't deal with those hurdles, you're not gonna make it into puppetry anyway because it's a darn hard career. It is really damn hard to be a puppeteer. We all know this. It's hard work. It's hard to get the jobs. It's hard physically challenging what you do. On so many levels, your brain is functioning. You're acting, you're singing, you're dancing, you're moving. You've got to figure out how to make this inanimate object breathe and live. It's a hard job. And if you, you, the hurdles that are thrown in front of you are many, many, many. And actually, I think the ethnic one is, is a tough one right now. We have to figure out how to get more people of color into, the, into what we do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's uh, it's interesting how I think it goes back to opportunities and exposure, and to to let uh, people of color know that this is an option right. that you could do, you know, like theatrically or <clears throat> or even professionally, and just expose them to this as all the opportunities that you can, so that when there is a casting call, then there is more people instead of like possibly the same names like coming through so that you can get uh, more of a rich like turnout of people. And I think what will help now is social media and the internet and Facebook and just having these conversations right now, letting people know that there are puppeteers of color out there that are like available and waiting and wanting to know like how, how do I get to be where I and Pam are and you too, Liz, like how do we get to to be you. And so this is a really great, great start, but it all starts with opportunity and exposure. Were there any puppeteers of color that you saw that made you think that this career was accessible to you? I, well, when I was growing up, and same thing with Pam too, there were a lot more TV shows mm -hmm. on with, with, with puppets and all that. And it's like, there was like Sherry Lewis and Captain Kangaroo and Paul Winchell. And there, there was great, like, the, like during that time, um, there was this, there were great local shows that always had like a puppet show, and they would always have puppets on. But they were primarily like performed or hosted by white people. And so the only puppeteer I ever saw who was non-white was Willie Tyler on Laughing, and he's a ventriloquist. Willie Tyler and Lester. And Lester was a little oh, black yes. ventriloquist dummy. Yes, yes. And it blew my mind. I was like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's like the puppet's black. And so, <laughs> and it was great. And that's the only time I've ever, ever seen it. But it just like, it's like subconsciously flipped a switch and just added to like, well, maybe I could do this too. Mm -hmm. And then later on with the height of the Muppet show and seeing Jim Henson and those guys doing it, it made me, it solidified me, okay, then this could be an actual career choice for me yeah. too. Yeah. That's true. Um, I mean, I think of Senior Wences as the only other yeah. sort of ethnic person that you ever saw doing, you know, so right. Um, it was yes. just. <laughs> My dad is obsessed with Senior Wences. <laughs> <laughs> And he was on the Muppet Show. Senior Wences was on the Muppet, Muppet Show. show. <laughs> yeah, which is amazing. But 
But I think that semi-culturally, for a lot of reasons, it's not, it wasn't, it's not a career. It's hard enough for everybody to understand that it's an available career and how you mm -hmm. get that information out. But even so, and culturally, so then it's even harder the further out you go into, into minority groups, it's even harder to find someone who is representational of being a puppeteer and what that means and what you have to do and how you can learn this. Um, it's, it's, you know, that's the reason I, uh, the O'Neill for me is what that's about. You know, that, that for me, ultimately, I want to reach out to as many people as I can to be puppeteers and particularly people of color. Um, for so many years, I've been pushing uh, scholarships and um, ways of reaching into the universities, you know, the HUBs and the getting it out there that we have this course in puppetry. And if you want to come, we'll do everything we can to get you in the door and let you know that it's a viable career and it's out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and you can start it younger. I mean, I, I, was ta I taught at the University of Hawaii for quite a few years. And um, there are several people who have come through are now puppeteers that I work with, you know, that are in the world with me. Um, and it, it was so hard to just pull teeth to get these people in, you know, it's just the way we have to do it. We has to start younger if possible, like doing, I used to do, um, for my kids every year, I had a different puppetry introduction show for the mm -hmm. school. I had the kin you know, kindergarten one was different than the first grade, different than the third, and it went all the way up to 12th grade. And when I got up there, when I was doing the high school talks, then I could really talk to them about this being a viable career and all the, all, all the adjunct jobs that go with this viable career, like wrangling. Whoever would think that you could actually make a living wrangling puppets and for, you know, building puppets, a, a full on great living doing that if you're good at it. You know, it's, it's that whole, how do you get that information out, particularly to uh, communities of color? Mm -hmm. How do we reach out and do that? That's really important to me, how we continue to do yeah. that. There was, okay, now this is the shameless plug because it's a great book. It's like Leslie Ash just created this book, Out of the Shadows. And in it, it shows like all these different troops from around the world that were part of the Jim Henson Puppetry Festival. And inside you can see all kinds of people making a living and doing like puppetry in all styles and all shapes and all sizes. So again, like that kind of exposure, like getting kids of any age just to see that, that these people can, can, can actually do it. Yeah, and on the international circuit, there are far more um, varied communities of color performing. Um, and it's also, I mean, that is a cultural event for Americans. We don't think of puppetry as a viable career. We don't think of it as a viable art form. So therefore, people aren't going to go into it. Um, in Europe, it is a much more viable way to survive. It is a much more, um, you know, there are people who are hired by theaters and paid every day to be puppeteers, which for Americans is a shock that you would do that. Um, in this country, you have to really, you know, make it on your own, basically. You, you have to scratch and work, keep, you know, work really hard and keep going. There's no, um, and there's sort of no safety blanket for puppeteers like there is a little bit in Europe, you know, that there are troops and communities of puppeteers who, who get paid on a regular basis, who can make a really good living just being a touring puppeteer. That's almost impossible in this country, um, you know, for most companies and troops. If they're more than two people, you're not going to make it. And in Europe, there are big troops that all survive quite well. It'd be a, it's great, you know, we keep pushing forward to, to make this art form more acceptable and understood by uh, the greater culture in America. And that's one way too, to continue to get more people involved and therefore we would have more people of color working in, in this uh, field. Yeah, I feel like so much of our industry is just a war of attrition. Like who are the people that can keep working and, can and slogging and working. can yeah. afford to you know i mean when you're starting out can you afford to keep being a barista and then do puppet shows at night mm -hmm. is that making enough of a living to drive you on it's hard it's very hard you know and and to then not have the the form respected in the way that it is in other countries in other parts of the world makes it doubly hard to continue mm -hmm. on that path you know? yeah and what are the ways you think that being a person of color compounds that? 
well, being a puppeteer, first of all, you, you know, you might be assigned to like a commercial or a TV show or a movie and somebody thought, oh, it'd be funny to have a, a puppet do this. But nine times out of 10, the person really doesn't understand what that means. <laughs> and so half of, like Pam was saying, like the physicality and like being in this position, trying to make this thing move is having to actually explain like puppetry 101 to this person to say like, <laughs> in order for you to get this shot and to make it look good, I need this and I need this and I need this and I need this. And a lot of times they, they just don't understand. And it's like, why? And it's like, you, and you really have to like explain them or show them examples or, or if they do give it to you and then you do it, that's when they get, oh, that's why he needs it. Yes, that's why I needed a monitor. So this way, <laughs> see what you see. And that's why it looks so damn good. Yes. <laughs> true. Um, also, let's just get into a conversation. What are some experiences that you've had on set as a person of color, either positive or negative, where <clears throat> you've been basically the only person of color on set? Like, I assume that that's not unusual. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Um, there was a show actually uh, several years ago, I was involved with Bear, but there was this other show on and uh, the puppeteers were, for that show were primarily white, but the characters, uh, one of the characters wasn't, one of the characters was black. And so the network was worried about having a white guy like puppeteering and voicing this black character. And so they sent me to the, to, to the production, flew me there and I saw what he was doing, and I thought it was great. But then sat down with, with the executive producer, the creator. And the guy really wasn't happy with what the puppeteer was doing. And since the character was black and he liked like electronics and computers and, and all that, it's like, could he make, uh, you know, like beep up sounds like, like whizzes and, and pings when he, when he talked. And I said, you mean like the guy from the Police Academy movies? <laughs> And he said, he said, yes, you know, oh, <laughs> wait, he said, yes, you know, like, you know, how, how those guys in Harlem talk, you know, the way, the way they, the way they talk like that. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm from Harlem and <laughs> this is the way I talk. That's such a weird stereotype. All black people are Michael Winslow. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll mention it at the meeting tonight when we all get together, you know. <laughs> Um, I had a wonderful experience, which was they were looking for the caretaker for um, Big Bird. Um, and they, they knew they wanted it to be a, an aunt rather than a, um, a, a mom or a grandma or whatever, because they, this was a, a series we did of uh, baby, Big Bird, baby, cookie, baby. So the caretaker needed to be an aunt. And um, I said, I wanted to do a Hawaiian auntie. I, I want to do this. Can I do it this way? So I just went in with a pigeon accent, which is what we spoke growing up. And so she would take care of big bird. Come on, baby bird. Let's take a nap. Now you go moi moi, which is Hawaiian for sleep. And so I managed to sell it to them. <laughs> and they let me do it. I was so excited. Kevin Clash let me do a Hawaiian accent. It was like, what? <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> um, and she was, she's been my favorite character uh, in so many ways because of that but I mean she was just on for those six episodes but she she was very loving and she had her own songs and we translated them into Hawaiian some of the songs we turned them more Hawaiian like I said like moi moi means go sleep or um you know emo emo hoku ike which is uh, uh, Hawaiian singing uh, twinkle twinkle little little star we did those kind of things and it was really nice to feel like I was bringing this different kind of culture, it's much more unknown, into Big Bird's world and into the world of the kids out there too. It was really, really an honor to be able to do that. And that's going back to what you were saying, like adding your cultural experience right. and your background, mm -hmm. and it was perfect. And I remember yeah. those, those videos. Matt, my son and I are in it when he was a baby. Yeah. And I remember that. And then those videos were so sweet. And, were... and, and your Nani was so, so sweet. It was like yeah. wonderful. When I... Uh, about seven years ago, I got um, the Muppets were um, promoting this um, 
uh, these puppets called whatnots that you could like create your own version of it. And so the whatnots take over the Today Show. So I got to be the Al Roker whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> and then just last fall, uh, Sesame Street took over the Today Show and they had AM versions of the characters. And Matt Vogel cast me as Al Roker, <laughs> having not known that I had done it seven years before <laughs> for the Muppets. <laughs> so that's good casting in your favor. <laughs> and, Al actually, and Al actually remembered me. Because when I came on set with the Al, he was like, no. <laughs> I had this great picture of all three of us together, which is great. Lovely. Lovely. Uh, Pam, going back to your story, like, I think that's such a great example that everybody was so receptive to it. Right. Um, what are the things, like, I feel like that's such a perfect bit of white allyship. And what are some other ways you would like to see white people step up, <laughs> basically? Well, I kind of think just acknowledging that, that we have these feelings and that it exists. I mean, mm -hmm. I think this is a hard thing and we're gonna make mistakes talking about it and bringing this stuff out. It's yeah. just, it's a very difficult conversation. But I, I think I would, I would love it if they would say, is there some other way we can approach this character or this problem or this topic? And in your background, what happened then? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So after school, what did you do? Well, most of my friends had to go to Japanese school to learn Japanese. So I was by myself a lot. Or I went to hula classes after school because that was what was available to us. You know. Um, how does that change? How does that change the story, the, the cultural imperative that is different than what everybody else assumes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's interesting. It's yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the fact that this conversation and other conversations have come up and it's, it's, it triggers a lot of reactions out of people because of the fact, again, because of social media, you're able to just like post something and just, ask or note something and just like say it. And the reactions can be very supportive or the person can feel like victimized and like, mm -hmm. or you're making me the villain. It's like, it's, it's not my fault or right. you're wrong. And um, it was like, um, you know, posting something and saying that, you know, this particular, you know, production, it's like, like all the puppeteers are white. And then to be be told, like, oh no, you're wrong. We have a whole diversity of into the entire production, and it's like trying to explain, like, at this time, there's a difference between diversity and representation, mm -hmm. and you could have like the most diverse show for that great group photo, but unless you have people of color in empowerment roles who can make decisions, who are key cast members, who are in executive positions, who are in writing positions then you really don't have diversity, you have tokenism. And so just being able to just have a conversation about that and like approaching things differently, it's like that's like the start. And it's gonna get all kinds of reactions from people, but it's, it's needed. And I think that people have to be willing to be uncomfortable and be wrong, you know, in all of us. Cause this is a whole new area that we haven't really been allowed to talk about it's sort of like the last shame, you know, it's like, it, it just needs to be said that we're going to make mistakes and it's okay. And we understand each other and we're going to continue forward in this direction as a group, you know, mm -hmm. working through it as human beings, moving, moving the whole society forward by doing that, by taking that risk, by being uncomfortable, by stepping in it sometimes, you know? And yet you can't be, afraid to mention and bring it up for fear of, you know, reprisal. Right. It's like, oh, he, he mentioned that. Oh, she pointed that out. Oh, it was like, well, obviously, you know, we don't want that kind of person here or, you know, they're obviously not happy here or they're, they're bringing stuff up, but they are stirring things up. Right. You know, if you want to make it old school, they're being uppity. And so there's Ooh, that fear okay. of, yeah. that fear of reprisal. So like mentioning like, you know, if a certain show has like predominantly white people, it's like, have I just run the risk of like not getting hired again by that show? Well, if that is the punishment I get for just speaking my mind and asking, well, then maybe I don't want to work with these people. And yeah. maybe like it could be a learning lesson for them in the long run. Right. Mm -hmm. well, that's all that comes from. 
Um, I don't want to end this part of the conversation, but it is time for us to open it up to Q and A. So thank you guys so much for talking with me and I will now toss sure. it over to Chris Thomas A. Yay. Oh my goodness, that was fantastic. <laughs> um, let me just say uh, the entire time I'm just sitting like, ah, oh, this is great. A um, lot of great questions. <laughs> thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than like, oh, Jesus Christ, what are they talking about? Can they get off now, please? Somebody shut them up. <laughs> uh, when is the NBA coming back? <laughs> uh, this is great. Um, a lot of great questions over in the um, chat. You can still add it uh, if you haven't um, had a chance to add them. If you've been wrapped in the tension like I have. Um, but uh, I want to start with um, a lot of people are asking the same stuff. Um, how do we get more people of color, um, and even women, into the the um, onto production, into puppetry, into like the big the, the big companies that you think of when you think of uh, puppetry on television and film? Yeah, it's like puppet puppetry right off the bat is a very boys club kind of profession. Yeah. There's it's pretty much male dominated. And so and so for women to like to get in and then a, a woman of color <laughs> to get in yeah. will be, you know, it's it, 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 it's a challenge in general. I mean Pam could speak more of this than, well, than I, I can. Yeah. I do think that we just have to keep opening doors and we have to keep asking and we have to keep knocking and we have to share the information that with both the corporations and the companies that are doing shows and with the people who are we want to come into the puppetry world people of color women and somehow get those two talking and continually tell both sides look this is what's happening this isn't right this is what's happening you can change this this is what happens it's happening let's keep moving forward it's all about communication and letting people know that we we see you <laughs> on both sides we see what you guys are doing and we know when you're trying to improve it and when you're not when you're just going with the status quo so I think that's one step in the right direction, you know. Absolutely. Forward. I think also we talked about, um, I don't know how I many people turned tune into the podcast, was uh, just like, there's a balance to it of us getting more people of color into the field and creating stuff. We have so many great platforms out there, TikTok and YouTube right. and right. Instagram, but also getting a balance of having programs that, can, that are looking for people of color for women to um, make that thing. So I do think there's a balance. I love that. Um, yeah, and I'm, it has to be financially balanced too. I mean, right. that's yes. a huge thing is that, you know, in, in puppetry, the people who make the most money are the white men right now, always. And that has got to change. It has to be balanced between men and women and balanced with people of color. That's fantastic. All right. I'm hoping that knocks out a bunch of questions for folks out there. Um, Okay, we have a lot of questions about uh, code switching. Do you feel that you've ever had to code switch on set or to take on characters? Or do you feel like you've had to suppress parts of yourself when you're either in the, the business part of puppetry on set, if you're directing or producing um, in that environment? Mm -hmm. Well, there are times you have to bite your tongue and step back because it, it's partially politeness, partially, um, in interest, I, my interest is always the best show I can possibly produce with anyone and make with anyone. So sometimes I do find myself stepping back a little and not expressing myself fully in order to get the show moving forward and getting what we need done. And that this for me is, there, it's always becomes, is this the time, is this the fight I'm picking? Mm -hmm. Is this the right fight to pick? And there are times it's just not, and you step back. And there are times when you just go, no, I can't, I can't do this. This is not what my character would say. This is not yeah. appropriate. I have to stop here. Can we talk about this? How, so, what was the yeah. point when you, what was the point of your life when you felt like you got to that step where you were able to like voice your concern without being like, they're gonna kick me out of here. I think it was last week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's my job now. I have no job. No. Uh, <laughs> No, it takes a while. It takes a while to be confident in doing that. And for me, I always have to be standing on the side of a group of people. I it is very hard for me to stand up for myself alone. But if I think Noel is being, something's going on with Noel, forget it. I'm right there. I'm a bulldog. I'm going to rip your throat out if you, you say that to him again, right? 
But for myself, it is a much harder process. All right, I want to keep moving along here. Try to try to get everybody in. Um, are there any? Was there any time in your history growing up when you felt like you've uh, missed opportunities or missed uh, puppet gigs or work because of uh, uh, your color or because of your ethnicity or any other factors like that? Um, it's it's like you say it's such, this is such a specific niche of a of a profession to get into so it sometimes it's like something could happen like on the west coast or like across the sea and you're just like logistically you're not there to be hired as like you know a local or or, or something so it hasn't really like for me it hasn't really like affected like the fact that i'm like i'm not away it's more like like location because again these these jobs few and far between is like Right. Where is it? And am I willing to like go like temporarily live here for like a couple of weeks in order or months, to, months yeah. to, to do this job? Yeah, there's that side of it. And then there's also, um, you know, it's a subjective job. Maybe you're not the right character. Maybe you weren't what they were looking for. And it's maybe that you're a woman or maybe that you are black and they're not going to necessarily they don't have to cop to it because it has to do with talent and it's subjective yeah. as to what the producer is looking for you know so we do kind of it's kind of a touchy area of how you figure out um why you didn't get a job yeah. i mean we've all auditioned for jobs that we didn't get can i point my finger and say it's because i was a woman or because they knew i was asian and they didn't want to have any smarty ass asian in there like me um <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm bad at all, <laughs> but, but um, you just don't know, you, you know, because it is a double thing. It's not only who you are, it's what you're doing. Um, so it, it, it is a little complicated in that way to say that point your finger and say, I didn't get that job because I was a woman. I didn't get that job yeah. because. Yeah, I can think of an example now. I didn't get that job because I was a puppeteer several years ago when they were bringing War Horse to the United States and they had this a, a casting call for puppeteers to come in, like send your resume. And nobody I knew who was a puppeteer was asked to the audition. They just wanted dancers and actors that they could train in their style mm. yeah. to puppeteer the horse. It was like, well, it's fine, but then don't say you want puppeteers <laughs> because there are specific us here who I'm sorry, we really could have animated your horse, <laughs> but you didn't want to go there. <laughs> so don't say you want a puppeteer. <laughs> this is great. Uh, this uh, next question is from uh, Raymond Carr. Uh, it's for Noel. Oh God, Raymond Carr. <laughs> <laughs> He's going after you, man. <laughs> Our boy what? Is uh, no, growing up in Harlem, did you ever get pushback from your family or friends about being an artist in a predominantly white art form? I was teased in, in elementary school because I, 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 I love the Muppets. I, and I still, I watched Sesame Street even though I was like, you know, you know, in elementary school. And I got like, you know, teased about it. And, but I didn't care. I was just like, this is what I liked. I wasn't going to change because of, because of the fact that, like, you know, you don't happen to get it. It's like, this is my thing and it's fine. And then I ended up um, in my final, um, when I was in fifth grade, I ended up, on lunchtime teaching the little kids how to make puppets. And so it's like, it came in, it came in handy. And so it's just like, you know, th there will be people who don't understand, maybe you'll get picked on and bullied, but I always think, you know, you know, I was a bear in the big little house. Like I worked with the Muppets. I worked with Jim Henson. I'm here right now. It's like those people who bullied me, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's called karma, baby. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh... Oh, this is a great one. Uh, uh, a couple questions about uh, appropriation, because you have, I mean, puppeteers, we always borrow from other art forms. We borrow from uh, Indonesian shadow puppetry. Uh, I noticed we're both wearing a Hawaiian shirt today, Chris, <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> Pam could get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, what, are you, <laughs> what are your thoughts about uh, uh, appropriation of art styles in puppetry, if it be a theater or theater, uh, theater or, or television or film, uh, using puppetry that comes from another culture and, and making it something that we use on TV. How do you feel about that? 
I think if it's done respectfully, I think it's it's good. I'm only thinking right now of like one of my favorite shows and apparently one of his favorite Muppet shows, Jim Henson, was the show with Harry Belafonte. Mm -hmm. And that last bit with the African masks is still one of my favorite pieces of puppetry I have ever seen. Now, were any of the puppeteers black? No. <laughs> but it's like knowing those puppeteers, they were, v and knowing Jim, they were very respectful. And having Harry Belafonte on too, and consulting mm -hmm. with him, they were very respectful of how they presented this song and presented these masks. And it's still one of the most beautiful pieces that has ever been seen. So that's one of, that's like the good thing. Then you see like other stuff <laughs> that's just like, it's like, why, why, why are you doing that? Why are you? Well, it's, and it, it's a very touchy area. It's yeah. very touchy. I mean, all arts I think are questioning when they, they appropriate, appropriate the style or the look or the, you know, I mean, we don't want to see native indigenous people's, you know, costumes on the wrong thing, right? So um, one thing we do have, which is pretty interesting as puppeteers is that we can extrapolate. We can take the idea and then change it and make it into something that's mine and theirs perhaps, a sharing of those kind of things and do it respectfully. Um, but you know, there are things about have, you know, I think about, like having a, a puppet dressed in a Chinese costume, is that inappropriate? When the puppet is maybe talking about Chinese culture? I mean, I don't know where those lines are. And it's very uncomfortable and it's very difficult to get that right. Um, my, my best thought is like we did this anti-panda show, which was all about, uh, was teaching Mandarin to, to French children, go figure. Um, <laughs> that's what we did. Um, but we always had consultants on set who were fluent in Mandarin and understood the culture. I mean, there, I remember one instance where we had a, um, white lanterns all over the set and they said, oh my gosh, that represents a funeral. You have to take those all down. <laughs> that's, that's and right. so we went, oh, thank you. Thank God you're here because we would not have even known. So there are balances and ways to do it. And if you are going to do it in that kind of fashion, you better have a really good consultant on board who can tell you exactly what's going on. That's great. I got a couple more, are they pinging me? No, I'm good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hurry up, what are you doing? Chris, uh, me, me, me. Another one, uh, no, you talked about tokenism. Do you feel it's being addressed in the industry uh, and have, and, and what are some strategies that you would use to imp improve the inclusion of other ethnic groups? I think it's gonna be starting to be addressed now because again, like we, we're seeing a time, I mean, for so many reasons, we're seeing a time that has never affected like so many of us uh, uh, at once. I mean, aside from the whole COVID thing, we're seeing like such rapid change. I mean, so much has happened just like in the past like couple of weeks in terms of, of uh, addressing uh, racism, discrimination. And so just having like these talks and bringing up, like for instance, I, uh, there was an um, uh, article today that the Broadway League is going to have an open discussion and consciously have more people in positions of empowerment for uh, 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 people of color, in positions uh, of empowerment so that they can change. And so having organizations and having companies, having productions realize, hey, you know what, we could do better and trying to actively look on the outside. For instance, it's like, and again, I was very proud of her, uh, Kay Starling Wilson just became the, the new um, VP right. of jobs of like creative production for Sesame Workshop. And that's great. And it's like, that's exactly what we're talking about in terms of representation, as well as the fact that she, she deserves it. She, she earned the right to deserve it. And she has a sense of humor, thank God. So, so this helps with Sesame. So it's like, it's for the fact that, <laughs> so the fact that that has happened is, is good. So having like this kind of a discussion and then just having more opportunities for people of color of performing, of like Pam said, like, you know, wrangling, you could be a wrangler, you know, costume design, you know how many costumes puppets wear <laughs> sometimes? <laughs> On Puzzle Place, my character had the highest wardrobe level 
<laughs> followed by the dog and the cat. So <laughs> Leon was all about the bling. <laughs> uh, so, so it's like all these little careers you didn't like think of. And so just having that kind of like exposure and discussion and then figuring out, okay, well, how can I do it? How can I like um, get an internship or practice? And so getting those, that, that pieces of information out there can really help moving forward. And I think as a person of color, or as a white person, you have to ask the question. When you get a job and you look around and there is no other person of color there, you have to be brave enough to kind of ask the question. It's like, shouldn't this be a little more diverse, this lineup of people here that you're hiring? Have you guys thought about it? Because sometimes the companies, they're just, honestly, I can see them just saying, I'm going for the best person I could find right. and not even consider the other opportunities and doors to knock on to get other great people in the door who may not look like you. You know, it's, 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 a, we have to ask that question all the time of the people we're working with. Yeah. It's sort of like just, and fighting, ourselves. yeah. And, and just fighting sort of like the ingrained kind of like racism we we've sort of grown up with and just got used to and like mm -hmm. part of a, a foundation because when people think and that's the other thing discussing racism itself when you hear the word racism you think of like slurs and lynching and like right. violence and it's like but there's the other side of racism too where it's just it's just it's just a given that you think like oh it's just like you know this, well that's the way it is yeah. yeah yeah this is the way it is and it's not until somebody of color is in that role and that's when it's like oh wait a minute oh, it's wait, like wait a minute hold it much better yeah, yeah. <laughs> or different you know? or different I mean, yeah different it's a different view right you know? different view or the whole like whole thing was like no 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 that that, that character is white what are you doing and it's like well why is that character white it's like because you've always thought of that character as white it was it was depicted as white it's like well now it's being depicted as this way because and this is key this is an imaginary character. <laughs> so it it's be purple anything. for God's sakes. It, so could, it could be, be anyone. Any, it could be anyone. It's <laughs> <Yes. laughs> like Hermione became black on Broadway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that know, was awesome. Emma, right. Emma, Emma, Emma Thompson played. And people had this whole kerfuffle over it. It's like, folks, she's an imaginary character. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, this is great. Thank y'all so much. I mean, we're going to start wrapping it up now. Um, uh, so this is fantastic if you're watching at home. Uh, we're doing what everyone should be doing. We're just starting conversations. Um, I'm, I've seen the, the participant list. Some of you are very well uh, acclaimed and awarded puppeteers. You can have really good conversations too. Some of you are just starting out at the school level. You can have great conversations too. It's just a matter of asking the questions and being open to um, everything that's coming at you. So I have a lot of questions that are still in the feed and we will get to them in later conversations. This hopefully won't be the last thing, but I just yeah. wanted to thank y'all. And um, I guess Dave will come back on or someone will come back on and we'll do, uh, we, what's next, homework? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you thought you were getting off this easy? No, 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 homework. <laughs> homework, yeah. online schooling. <laughs> So we've asked uh, Pam and Noel to give everybody uh, some homework, a, a couple suggestions of books or shows or articles that they've read recently that they think would be great for everyone else to check out. So right. uh, Pam and Noel, what do you got? I got this book. I love this book. It is making me think in all kinds of different wa ways that I had no idea. And it's making me brave. So go ahead and, and go for this one for sure. And the other one is... Um, how to be an anti-racist is the other book that's fantastic. I don't have it right at my hand. And I have one more thing. This is my creed for life. And aloha isn't just hello, goodbye, and what you say. Aloha means to live with compassion and understanding and love. And so that is what I want everyone to do with each other if you can. Live aloha. Beautiful. I, I, re that. I remember I had... Actually, had this. So, just to give you a sense of like history, like this isn't the first time like all these marches and protests and discussion and discrimination and unfairness happened. So, it's like this is like the three volume book March, great, oh, based on cool. Congressman John Lewis. It's like three volumes, it's a graphic novel. It is one of the most excellent things you could ever want to read. You should definitely check it out at your library or your independent bookseller. And it's great because it's like, what, what is happening here is happening again. 
Yeah, I love that. Uh, that is actually uh, illustrated by one of my all-time favorite illustrators. It's it's beautifully written, beautifully illustrated. You'll have to find it. Absolutely, highly recommend. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think we did it. This is incredible. Um, <laughs> this is so great. We did it, guys. Great job. Uh, yeah. So, Huzzah! <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, Huzzah! so everybody cracks open their drink now, and we just... Uh, no. Thank God, it's after four o'clock. <laughs> it's after four, yeah. It's after four, it's that's after great. Four. It's good time, it's not five, it's Tell four. You. We start putting on our tuxedos, and we open up our drinks. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Pam and Noel, for coming on here. You Thanks both are us, yeah. a constant inspiration, and and uh, just ah, beautiful humans. I love you both so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you again, Dave, Liz, and Chris, Chris. for putting this whole thing together. Amazing. This was great. And I'm curious to see, like, for all of you watching, like, what conversations you're going to have and want to talk about and be posting about. And um, this whole thing was recorded. So please, like, share the link with other people who weren't able to come today right. and watch. Yeah. And there'll watch. be more, yeah. right? Are there more coming up, guys? Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Uh, yeah. And we'd, we'd also love to have you both back for even more in-depth conversations. Okay. Yeah, like Chris was mentioning, you know, we've, uh, the cool thing about Zoom is that all the questions that were asked, we have those and we'll be saving them. And so if there's there's a bunch that we couldn't get to that are really great and important questions. Right. And when we do our one-on-ones, we want to bring those questions back because I do okay. think that we need to touch on them. Uh, so yeah, we've got a few more people that we're talking to, uh, to bring on that are incredible and we'll definitely be doing more. Uh, so yeah, Liz, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Chris, you're incredible. Thank you. Uh, Cassie, my amazing wife, who is Yay, Cassie! Yeah, Cassie! <laughs> Put everything together. She's been doing all the heavy lifting. We oh did. my God. Like, right. Incredible. Yeah. We love her amazing. so much. And of course, thank all of you for tuning in uh, now with us live, submitting amazing questions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to all those who are watching this recorded, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your day to watch this. Uh, so thank you and have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Wear a mask, please. Yes, please. wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Wash your hands. <laughs>